Hello and welcome to Insights, everyone. My name is Namde Odipo. The disbursement of the National Cash Transfer Scheme under the National Social Safety Net Program has been making the round. Today, we get an update on the latest happenings, plus care for the elderly. Uh, will the newly established National Senior Citizens Centre change the narrative? Elizabeth Omori is here with me, as usual, of course. Elizabeth, what do, we, what do you have for us today? Well, on the media review segment, we are not done with security yet. We will be taking a look at enforcement, society and media, the way forward. Uh, very well then, let's get started. My first guest is Yowa Pere. He is the National Coordinator, National Social Safety Net Coordinating Office, Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development. Welcome to Insight. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I, I understand that as the coordinating office for the National Social Safety Net Scheme, you, you're mandated to facilitate and support state operations coordinating units as well. I mean, particularly to conduct identification and registration of poor and vulnerable households. So, is the bulk of the responsibility on the state to set the parameters for, for those who are truly poor or, uh, and, and afterwards identify and register them in the National Social Register? Or is that all on you? And um, aside that, how do you as the National Coordinating Office validate that register? Yes, uh, thank you so much. The responsibility of raising the social register is on the state offices. And in each of the state of the federation, the state operations and coordinating unit, the body responsible for raising the register is domiciled in the Ministry of Planning for each of the state, report, reporting to the permanent secretary Ministry of Planning of each of the state. The federal entity is responsible, like every other federal entity, for policy direction, guidelines, uh, and the framework for collecting the data. And so once that is said, the state governments then implemented. Now, for identifying the political words or the communities or local government that they start generating the social register in, each state uses what you call uh, their poverty map. You will recall that in, two, in April 2000 and, uh, 2020, the National Bureau of Statistics released what you call the National Living Standards Survey results wherein the country was estimated to be uh, about 40%, 40.2% on living below poverty line. This provides the basis for a poverty map. So across the country, you will see that the states are run from the poor to the poorest. And this extends to all the local governments as well. So each state will use their own poverty map to determine the local government, the poorest local government that will start generating the register. So the responsibility of identifying the initial local government to start work in is that of the state. However, it's in discussion and agreement with us, okay. bearing in mind that it has to be then the evidence-based as the data provides. That, that, in fact, that was my follow-up question. How do you now validate the register to ensure that it's actually capturing the poorest of the poor? Now, the act of capturing the poorest of the poor in itself, it's, uh, it's done through what you call a community-based targeting system wherein the community will sit themselves, define poverty within the context of that community, and thereafter identify those who are poor and vulnerable. For each community of the Federation, over 90,000 of them, each community has what you have, a, co a harmonized community list. What we do when we receive the data from the state, after other processes, we also do what you call a back check, wherein we go to the communities and cite this community list. We also have CSOs, the civil society organization, okay. who are tech party monitors. As you know, they are independent of government. These people go to the state independent of us, independent of the state, independent of the local government to validate this list um, across uh, the country. You, you just talked about the third party now, and I, I monitored your recent media briefing on the National Social Safety Net third party scorecard dissemination. And, and afterwards, I got some rather intriguing figures off your web page. It says you're currently coordinating activities in the 36, 36 states of the Federation, plus the F, FCT, of course. It also Correct. says that you're impacting in 
304,209 poor and vulnerable households in Nigeria, while a total of 35 million 267,966 individuals in poor and vulnerable households have been captured under the program. So I would like to play the devil's advocate here. I mean, I haven't seen all of these figures. And then I'll ask you a, a, a direct question. Uh, just so you can clearly convince the doubting Thomases, are all of these figures and people Nigerians? Uh, yes, they are Nigerians, very, very clearly. And uh, you can actually confirm this beyond what is on our website to go to each state office. Now, the 90,000 communities, each community has a community list, domicile within the community. So when you take the records that we have and match it against the community list, you validate that indeed they are the list that are identified by their own community members. This is the first stage of validating the data. So indeed, every one of them is a Nigerian identified by their own community uh, residing in those communities uh, all over the country. So the figure you're really, really correct. And I'm impressed you've done your, your homework correctly. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Two quick questions for, for you. And one, please confirm again that all of the states in the Federation, I mean, cutting across the six no political zones, no states exempted, have, have keyed in into the National Cash Transfer Program. And two, is it possible for you to speak to the disbursement of the returned $103.64 million voucher loot distributed to the poor? Yeah, so uh, the social register is first in all 36 states of the Federation and the FCT. It is currently in 717 local governments, uh, 8,400 uh, political wards across 90,000 communities, plus communities. The cash transfer program is in all 36 states of the Federation and the FCT. By our current uh, disbursement, which will start very, very soon, we should be paying the cash transfer in all 36 states. As you are aware, the cash transfer started like the social register in the state, and we are growing them by the numbers. So currently, uh, we have numbers in all 36 states and the FCT for the next round of payment that will start in the next two weeks or so. And uh, so the cash transfer is being paid. Now, the abatter loot. As we know, um, the repatriated funds was 321.5 million US dollars. Of that amount, was paid up to 140 something plus million US dollars. Okay. And the arrangement with the World Bank facility is that we pay a certain percentage of the regular 5,000 cash transfer a month from the Abacha loan, mm -hmm. while a certain percent come out of the World Bank uh, loan. Uh, and then we have been paying this around the end every beneficiary. For every beneficiary that receives 5,000 naira at the moment, 80% of that money is from the Abacha loan. And 20% is from the World Bank uh, credit that we have. So, yes, we are paying and using the Abacha loop around the entire country. Uh, do you carry out a um, periodic evaluation of your engagement as the coordinating office for the National Social Safety Net Program? And, and I would also like to ask, um, um, if you do carry out such research, uh, what does it establish? Does it establish that the program is actually helping to elevate the burden on very poor Nigerians? Yes. Uh, we, uh, in the next couple of uh, days or weeks, we will be making public the beneficiary satisfaction survey that we carried out that will show clearly the, uh, indicate clearly the benefits and the reaction of beneficiaries out there. There are also loads and loads of success stories, and I'll give some of the examples. In fact, it was also carried by NTA, uh, the successful case in, uh, in uh, Quara State, wherein the beneficiaries of the conditional cash transfer contributed money and built uh, a classroom block uh, for their own community. And also the successful case in Chigawa, wherein they bought a vehicle that uh, carries pregnant women to the nearest hospital. We also have other success stories around the country. Now, our uh, survey just shows, and there's evidence clearly from what we have done and the research we've done, that the cash transfer to all the existing one million plus that we're currently paying 
uh, with the target of uh, meeting 2 million beneficiaries by September of this year, uh, that it is very impactful. Uh, evidence show in, the, in our country that there's a return of one, about 1 1.3 Naira to every Naira cash transfer given to a beneficiary. And then you will see very clearly some of the success stories. Now, in terms of figures, and this is also an argument that people put forward uh, quite a number of times, that teach people to fish rather than um, give them fish. fish. And the government, what the government has done with the cash transfer is not a bonanza. It's not a sharing of LHS. It's, it's simply a strategic investment in unlocking our economy. So the multiplier effect of a cash transfer is huge and it's there. And I'll give an example. I did this example, very simple example. A mudu of beans cost you 1,000 naira in the market today. Granite, a bottle of granite oil is around 350 naira. Condiment and coat to a mudu of beans. 700 naira, actually. Naira. Maybe you've not been yeah. to the market so with a bit. <laughs> yeah, so when you put this together, it's about 3,000 naira to start an Akara business. Oh. So when you give somebody 5,000 5, naira, you could use 3,000 naira to start an Akara business. And that one mudu of rice, um, of beans, will sell uh, your Akara boss of 5, five naira up to 40 40 of them, giving you a return on that 3,000 naira investment of about 1,000 naira, 1,200 naira. And when this person consistently collects this cash transfer every month, with that little business begin to expand. So you have this kind of success story. But what this success story here is this, is that it raises demand on the food store. So 68% of the cash transfer paid is used on consumption. The raising demand on food stock in our local market. Mm. And when demand increases what happens to your supply supply has got to meet it so pressure on the manufacturing sector and when you put pressure on the production sector you're going to reduce unemployment because companies are going to employ to ensure that they are meeting up the demand so thereby reducing unemployment you're going to put in more money because the merchant which is in the village that was catered to selling maybe a model of beans is now selling 10 models of beans because of the increase in demand Increasing its returns on the sales and thereby also increasing its investment. Countries all over the world use cash transfer as a quick strategy to uh, re uh, uh, reverse uh, some of the economic shocks. Like the US, you hear the argument in the US Parliament whether to do a cash transfer of $1,000 or $2,000 or $500. This is a quick way when you inject that kind of uh, cash into the economy, you are unlocking. Uh, your, your potential. So, for instance, the Nigerian government pays uh, uh, 10,000 naira every two, two months to cash transfer. One million of them, that's about 10 billion naira cash injected into our economy. And if 68% of that goes on consumption, that's increasing demand by that amount of money. That's increasing the, the pressure on our supply side for that level. And uh, the economic uh, effect of that can only be told in years to come. So strategically, we are doing that. And when the president says he has lifted up 10 million people out of uh, poverty, poverty yeah. perhaps he was a bit conservative because you look at the multiplier <laughs> effect of paying only 10 million. This is only cash transfer. This is not all the other efforts of government that are making in other areas of social investment or Uncle Boras program or uh, the SMAC program. Just cash transfer, 1 million, 10 billion every day, and the multiplier effect uh, of, of, of that across uh, the entire value chain. I, 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 I actually like the way you've brought up the, I mean, you've broken down the issue of the, um, of the cash transfer and how you've linked that to the, the dynamics in the economy and um, thrown up the issue of shock responsiveness. Uh, because I, I, I recall that you and I, um, some time ago in, in April 2020, at the onset of the COVID-19 in Nigeria, we did um, meet in the studio and we talked about um, some of these issues. That was why we were just preparing for the first phase of the national lockdown, which was, which was scheduled to begin May 4. But clearly, so much has happened between then and now. And so, um, mm. if 5,000 Naira, for instance, made reasonable impact for a poor family at that time, the purchasing power and value of 5,000 Naira has significantly reduced since April last year. I, I know you do not speak for the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, but as a unit under the ministry coordinating the disbursement of the national cash transfer, 
I'm sure you have experience in finance-based social interventions. So I would ask your thoughts on how best to strengthen uh, the National Social Register as a shock-responsive social protection system in Nigeria. How can we do that so that it responds to some of the shocks, you know, thrown up by the economy or by fiscal and um, by fiscal policies, at, at least? Thank you very much. So um, to answer your question, first of all, the social register from where we are uh, taking our beneficiaries for the cash transfer. But at, when the pandemic struck, uh, the social register, as we know, we start deriving from the poor communities, right? The economic shock occasioned by uh, the pandemic meant that the urban poor was most affected. Mm. So the Honorable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Zasa Management and Social Development, Ajasa Adia Omar Farouk, uh, approached uh, the, our principals to design what she called the Rapid Response Register for COVID-19 uh, cash transfer program targeting the urban poor. And this is the first time in our country that we're using scientific targeted means through SMSs the, uh, targeting the urban poor. So a total of 20 million uh, Nigerians are targeted through this process through SMS. And this has been ongoing in the country. We piloted this program. We paid a certain few individuals and we continue to raise the numbers to pay them. So on one hand, there's a regular cash transfer program. On the other hand, is a rapid response register targeting the urban poor as a result of the pandemic, as an initiative of the Honorable Minister uh, Sadia Omar Farouk, attending to this urban poor who catered uh, to were not in the register because they were not deemed poor at the time of generating that register. But because of the economic shock, they fully back into poverty. Right, those are the estimated five million to ten million that World Bank reports is that uh, Nigerians are falling uh, for that. So the government has quickly uh, established a rapid response that becomes a shock responsive strategy for the country going forward. Before we didn't have it, now we have. So anytime there is any economic shock or strategy of this ca uh, calamity or, or this capacity, the government will quickly activate the instrument of the rapid response register to okay. quickly identify and capture those who are most impacted by this crisis, bring them onto a platform that they can be at, that they can access uh, help easily. And so this register is with us. It is open to government, uh, uh, international organizations, philanthropic organizations, ETC to mine from. At the moment, we have the UN women mining from this social register and providing cash transfer to 10 most affected by the COVID. We have uh, uh, UNDP mining from the social register and giving cash transfer to uh, 10 states most affected by the COVID, about 100,000 of them. We have a Tony Lumine Foundation giving opportunity for close to 500,000 uh, youths uh, through this, uh, their business, uh, micro business initiative, wherein trainees access 500, uh, 5,000 US dollars at the end of the uh, internship scheme. And so, it's open to all commerce who want to use the register after duty signing an MOU with the ministry that give them access to it. Uh, just before I let you go, I, I do know that sometime in 2018, you, you entered into a partnership with the National Orientation Agency just so you can um, enhance and in increase participation in the social investment program of the federal government. How is that? How has that been going for you? And of course, in addition to other partnerships that you open, just so you can increase participation in the program. It's been going well, and I want to thank the DG of uh, National Authority Agency for uh, the support we get from this agency, right from the national to the state to the local government levels. Part of their support is the socializing and sensitizing the communities to, for building the social register. So their staff are with us, with our staff at local government, sensitizing the community, in their indigenous communities, languages. the of government and this. So it's going very well. Thank you so much. In their indigenous languages, I understand. It makes it a lot easier course, for them yes. to understand yes. and comprehend. Yes. Of course, yes. Um, and the other is really a strong structure. And National Orientation Agency, a very strong structure uh, within those local uh, level that will be using and leveraging on their structure. They are part of the uh, state uh, and the local government teams raising the social register and providing useful information to the community. They are also part of our grievance redress mechanism structure. 
where we are getting feedback from beneficiaries on exactly some of these challenges that we're having and that is helping the uh, strengthen the implementation of the program nationwide. Uh, you are Pere, National Coordinator, National Social Safety Net Coordinating Office under the Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development. I want to thank you so much for coming on Insight. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. My next guest is the Director General, National Senior Citizen Center, Dr. Mem Omokaru. Welcome to Insight Talk. Thank you very much, Namdi. Thanks uh, for having me. Congratulations, by the way, on the takeoff and constitution of the board um, for the center. Thanks for all the work you put in media, the media, <laughs> you know, helping to, us with the advocacy. Thank you very to much. Have you here. Uh, I did a bit of research on the enabling act of the National Senior Citizen Center, and I, I was quick to notice the rather generic objective in the declaration of um, policy for the establishment of the center. Where are we currently with a definitive national policy on the welfare of the elderly in Nigeria, seeing that such a policy has eluded us for decades? Oh, I'm happy to inform you that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have the policy now. The President, um, uh, His Excellency Mohamed Buhari, approved the national policy on aging. So we have that national policy on aging as a guide, you know, for, you know, the strategic plans of the center as well. So the two just aligned. Okay, so yeah. perfect. But is that different from the policy that establishes the center? Uh, the center, the center is an yes. act of parliament. The center an is an act of, of parliament, yes, exactly. It's an act of the National yeah. Assembly. Yeah. It's the legislation, you know, for the National Senior Citizen Center. There's a National Senior Citizen Center Act, you know, which um, mandates the setting up of the National Senior Citizen Center as a body corporate. It's like an agency That is actually what is quite popular. Yeah, with the board, mm. and then of course, you know, you recall that um, uh, June 17th, uh, that board was um, inaugurated yes. uh, as approved by the president, president inaugurated yeah. by the Honorable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, um, um, Haja Sadi Farouk Omar, Omar Farouk, rather. So now um, we are setting off uh, for a start, and of course, you know that uh, that's the center, the National Senior Citizen Center is going to sit as a secretariat, um, working with uh, senior citizens um, in collaboration with stakeholders and partners across all the MDAs that have the statutory mandate, you know, on human development that are related to, you know, all these uh, functions, for instance, health, social programs, sports, um, mm. um, you know, you know, uh, um, developing, you know, work schemes for older persons, entrepreneurship, because all these are the mandates of, of the Senior Citizen Center. So it's like a coordinating, initiating, collaborating secretariat, you know, working with all the stakeholders to ensure that um, we develop these in innovative programs and support services, and we work to give quick, very rapid access to older persons in all their diversities, uh, regardless of location. That, that's quite fascinating. But yes. I, I'd like to stay on the subject of, I mean, talking about the implications for a national policy. Yeah. And knowing that our laws recognize those from ages um, 65 or so, or 70 and above as elderly persons, I, I'm not sure. But what, what is the scope of the national policy on elderly persons in Nigeria? How expansive is, is this? Is this policy? The scope of the policy, of course, is very expansive. You know, the policy nests, um, for instance, one in the Constitution. And of course, you know, all the other um, development frameworks, the Sustainable Development Goals, 20, you know, 2030, the Healthy mm -hmm. Aging Framework, all the framework, the Madrid International Plan of Action. So it's quite expansive in scope. And it covers all the domains, all the okay. critical domains, income security, it covers you know, continuing engagement, employment, it covers uh, poverty, gender issues, it just covers everything. And of course, health, um, you know, and um, entrepreneurship, everything that has to do with human development. Uh, just to show you that, um, you know, older persons, you know, are bona fide citizens of the country. They have a right to, you know, every social program. They have a right to economic opportunities. They have a right, you know, to, 
you know, lifelong learning opportunities. Uh, so everything that will make older persons independent, have autonomy, and where their functional capacities begin to decline, mm. then we have all the supportive services, the long-term care, you know, systems. So the National Senior Citizen Center, as a matter of fact, will be that coordinating body to translate the policy Mm. to support the mandates of the national senior citizens, you know, to create all these, you know, programs, sports, recreation. What we are going to do is, number one, is that we have to fundamentally change the attitude and the perception of aging. Because aging is perceived in a negative way. Older persons are seen as, are seen as frail, spent, not mm. having anything to contribute. But I think we're going to be, is, we're going to inspire Nigeria. We are going to create a movement, and that's how I see it, so that everybody sees himself as, you know, growing towards being part of the National Senior Citizen Center. Healthy aging is going to be part of this, you know. Mm. We are going to stamp, you know, age discrimination, really fight against ageism, you know, and try to build very inclusive systems, you know, that give quick access to older persons as bona fide part of the citizens. I, I'd like yeah. to take you on some specific issues you mentioned, but that, that will be down the line when, when you talked about programs that will target priority areas of needs for yes. elderly persons. But, uh, Doc, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go on to, to ask you a, a question, and then I'll use myself as an example. In okay. some plans, uh, climbs, I beg your pardon, and um, like I said, uh, I'll use myself as an example. I could actually get paid for taking care of an elderly, maybe sick and dependent parent. And I'm talking about some form of state benefit. We have a different perception of taking care of our age. Uh, parents, you know, yeah, yeah you're and uh, we don't expect payment, but mm -hmm. um, are we not getting to a stage where, where either the country or the states can begin to give some form of financial benefit to individuals taking care of dependent as, elderly as, citizens? Yes, I get what you mean. Uh, because traditionally, of course, you know, mm. care of older persons, and actually, right, right now, it still falls to family. And when it comes to family, it is seen as reciprocity, the norms of reciprocity. Your parents took care of you, now it's your turn, exactly. you know, to reciprocate. So there hasn't really been a research, there hasn't really been an initi initiative in that regards to see the contributions of older, you know, um, caregivers, especially family caregivers. But what the Senior Citizen Center is going to do is that the Senior Citizen Center is going to take, we are setting up to take care of all these major domains to see the variables, for instance, concerning care. We are going to set up, in fact, there is going to be a critical department, you know, on care quality. Because if you know, notice what is happening, everybody just opening up any, you know, care homes, adult children that are not even professionals, they cannot take care of older persons with dementia, they are just battling and struggling mm. and, you know, being sandwiched between their own children and their parents. So the Senior Citizen Centre is going to take a critical look at these things. First and foremost, we are going to develop a national curriculum, a standard curriculum on caregiving. So we certify caregivers, especially managers, managers of any kind of facility, any kind of home that is set up and then ensure inspection. And then we are now going to look and encourage aging at home, where older persons age in the home, because that is where they are familiar with. And, you know, judging from our culture, mm. most are averse, you know, to being taken anywhere into any facility. So in that case, now, we are going to, we are going to try with the critical stakeholders and experts on the subject matter experts to see how we can now, you know, design some hybrid where the family meets, the social meets the medical. Where older persons are at home, you know, we train the home caregivers. We have some kind of respite and we have some kind of remedy. Where even uh, primary health care centers, you know, become parts where we, you know, where we collaborate with the primary health care center and we provide support system. Okay. How these support systems can penetrate the families. Okay. And then of course, maybe we now look at, for older persons who are still really heavily burdened, mm. you know, and they are sandwiched between their children, whether we can, you know, we are also a lobbying center, whether we can lobby for some tax rebates, okay. where, where such is the case. You know, so there's a lot that we, we are said to do. Uh, f fascinating, quite mm -hmm. intriguing, Doc, and, and I, must, I must commend you. Well, but there's something, interestingly, changes in family dynamics for, for instance, the passing of a provider or a benefactor yeah. could begin a process or perhaps a journey of neglect yeah. for, for affected senior citizens yes. within that family. Uh, and this is not Nollywood, uh, Doc. I mean, it happens. We've seen cases like that. Pop, pop, yeah, I'm in you know, the field of aging. I know it happens, yes. Uh, exactly. And I, I, I'm wondering, 
you, you, I know you're working on a register for senior citizens across yes. the country. Yeah. Can such a platform ultimately, and uh, it's not something that will be immediate, I get that as well, can that ultimately help monitor the health and well-being of abandoned or neglected elderly persons? And then you begin to make, or the center begins to make some form of intervention. I tell you, that's the support system that we are talking about mm. in the center. And so I does that cover that for it as well, what you explained What earlier? you are talking about is, is what social protection covers, okay. with social pensions, social care, which now has been introduced in the new and revised social protection policy that is coming. So we are going to be working up all the humanitarian affairs, you know, and the disaster uh -huh. management and the social exactly. development is our mother, um, mother ministry. Okay. So we are going to be working with them and NASCO, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, ensuring protection, prevention, and then ultimately interventions where you have such a situation that you described. And, 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 and I also want to say that support services are going to be available. In fact, we're going to have a desk right now because we have not all, you know, all together put up the infrastructure to take off. You know, we are not even writing also, and we, we need to do the paperwork for one, the, the, in the physical space as an office, and then the postings of staffs and all that. But right now we are doing very critical, very needful desk reviews to see, you know, already existing structures and processes and mechanisms that exist in our sister MDAs, for instance, the National Human Rights. We are already talking with human rights and investigating. They have already, you know, offices in all the states of the Federation. They already have an online portal for reporting of abuse. They already have, you know, investigative, you know, desk and all that. And then, so we want to see how we can collaborate with them. In fact, a tripartite co collaboration is what we are investigating and looking at before we approach them. Okay. To tell them, for instance, Legal Aid Council, you have this structure you have these mechanisms, you have these processes. Now we are on board, we can be the three of us, so everything will be seamless, you understand? So we can have a search and rescue, we can have a call desk, a call line specifically for older persons, which will be our own domain, and we see, okay, so what do we give and what do we take? Mm. And it's so that we now know that emphasis is on older persons. And since your structures penetrate across the nation, so we now know that, yes, we can easily, you know, get access to any older person there that needs help. So those are the things we are des reviewing on the desk and, you know, as soon as we take off, we're going to approach all these MDAs mm -hmm. to ensure that we, you know, take hold. We have an inclusive system where, you know, we, we work collaboratively so that we, we, we buy time and then we, we ride on their mechanisms that are already available and we ensure that older persons, especially in the remote you know, and the, you know, the rural environments are reached. Uh, you, also you, for primary care. Okay. Uh, you're clearly going to need a lot of these collaborations. Oh, and, yes. and, uh, it's a good thing you're already <laughs> yes. stepping up your game yes. and approaching um, some partners already. Yes. I was going to ask earlier about how you intend to set up the register for senior citizens in Nigeria. You, you already made allusions to the fact that you would work with NASCOs, that, that is the uh, National yes. Social Safety Net yes. um, uh, uh, um, uh, Coordinating Office. It's also under the same ministry yes, as yours. Uh, yeah. But I'm also wondering if this collaboration and partnership would not uh, perhaps extend to the tel um, telecom uh, telecommunication service providers, um, National Population Commission, because I, I know the Social Safety Net Coordinating Office uh, deals with the poorest of the poor. Yes. Wouldn't that be limiting your your target um, areas or, you know, your, your, mm -hmm. your target area. Wouldn't um, an agency like um, the NPC, for instance, the National Population Commission, give you a broader outlook? What, we, what yes. we intend to do, and we had been advocating for this for so long, but thank God now we have a platform and um, we're, we're also, you know, um, we don't have a budget, is to work with uh, the National Population Commission or the National Bureau of Statistics okay. to have for the first time a multi-indicator survey on older persons. Until we have that multi-indicator survey, which will capture older persons in their diversity, mm. their socioeconomic situation, you know, their human rights situation, economics, you know, everything about older persons, where they are, their numbers and all that. Until we have that, it will be very difficult for us to know exactly 
even when it comes to establishing senior citizen centers. So yes, we're going to work with NASCO on social assistance, social, you know, social protection, social pensions, but to talk now, to face and target the generality of older persons, we need to build our own database and manage our data system so that we can you know, have you know, programs that respond to the context, the context of each population category in the demographics of older persons. Great. Uh, um, Doc, you, you've talked about social pensions, you've mentioned that a number of times, but I have elderly relatives who retired as public and civil servants and have struggled over the years with the methodology of getting their pensions, not social pensions now, yeah. which we're still, I'm talking about the actual pensions, money they worked for, you know. Uh, is, is that an area that the center is also looking into, particularly Definitely. towards reducing the challenges there for senior citizens? You know, one of our targets, apart from fighting age discrimination, that's ageism, is also to fight material and social deprivation and to fight for the rights of older persons. Somebody had worked, you know, spent all his life and retired. I mean, accessing pension is his rights. So, of course, we are going to set up, like I said, our organogram, we're waiting for the approval, we have worked on it. There is a whole unit that is going to be focused on pensions payout. Okay. Pensions payout. So that unit will be, you know, in charge of developing those mechanisms, especially what is happening in the states. Mm. I think the federal government has been able to clean up some things, you know, uh, with PTAD, you know, going forward. I'm sure they are still working on it. And I'm sure that we can write on, you know, the lessons and the challenges that PTAD has had and, you know, be able to, you know, also, you know, intervene in most cases, you know, engaging with state governments, engaging with or every principal that has to do with pension payments. Because our, our, our strategy is to come to that place after we have developed all these programs and support services and engaged, you know, to ensure that older persons have quick access to all these services. Our joy would be to hear, you know, self-report from older persons to okay. say that now we feel dignified. Mm. Now, you know, we know we are valued. <laughs> now we feel like we are bona fide citizens of Nigeria. Indeed, now we have been integrated into development. Uh, and they that are, I mean, honestly, they yeah. are. Senior citizens yeah. are bona fide, I mean, valued members of our yeah. society. I'm I, mean, I was particularly fond of my grandma. I mean, everyone who's close to me uh, knows that. I mean, for a fact, I, I barely talk. I mean, I just mentioned that now. I'm always talking about uh, she's passed now for about 10 years. About, you know, every time the memory comes back and I, I grew up with that. And so, I mean, I, we, we actually value senior citizens and uh, some of us are actually fond of elderly persons. So, so I, I, I'd like for you to use this opportunity, Doc, to, to bring up other special privileges that might be given to senior citizens uh, currently under advisement by, by the center. Of course, I, I want to say first and foremost that in promoting the programs you know, and the services that this center is going to provide, we also want to promote that perspective that enhanced capacities of older persons to continue to engage in productive endeavors is an opportunity for economic development. And it's going to turn out that this center is going to be one of, you know, those centers that will be, you know, providing employment because mm -hmm. we are creating intergenerational programs. We will revive, you know, community enterprises that are led by older citizens and, you know, and, and, and inject, you know, some upgrade of technology. So one of those things, amongst the many things that older persons are going to enjoy is one, that they are going to have support of the center okay. out to fight elder abuse to fight violence, to fight neglect, and then two, isolation. Now, in the creation of these senior citizen centers and all the centers that are going to spring up, you know, places of recreation, places of social connectedness, you know, bringing psychological well-being, is going to be one of those rights they are going to enjoy, the right to have psychological well-being, one of the rights. And then, of course, recreation and sports, and then access to health, which is a right. Because if you notice before now, and, and you know, for the reasons you know, to stem down a maternal and you know, child mortality, our primary healthcare centers were really focused on maternal and child. But now what the senior center is going to do is it's going to work very closely, structural agreement with the primary healthcare center 
to ensure that yes, just as they have now, you know, you know, you know, you know inscribed it into their strategic plan, that geriatric assessment and geriatric treatments, you know, are going to be happening in our primary care centers, mm -hmm. and that all those wards and all those units that really tunnel down care into the rural areas are going to be revived. So uh, so the right we're to totally out of time. The, the right time. To care I'd like for us to round, to round yeah, off yeah, this conversation yeah. at this mm -hmm. point. But very quickly, before I let you go, if it's possible in 60 seconds, uh, what are your long, what are your short and long term targets for for the centre? The very sh the, sh the sh short and long term targets, what we have started now, we want to sensitise, publicise, and you know, so that once you see here national senior citizen, you know what it's about, exactly. and then we want to change the attitude. So we want Nigeria to know that. Look. This is economic growth opportunity that has been. And opened. in the long term. And in the long, no. And then, of course, we are going to, you know, have a, a, a database conduct mm, that yeah. uh, survey I told you about, and then engage with MDAs to see where we can use their structures and go on, and then, of course, engage with states because her constituents, you know, are in the states. Most of them are in the rural area, and of course, in the long term, we are developing very innovative intergenerational programs. Mm -hmm. that's going to create, bring that synergy and bring that dialogue between the two generations so that everybody will see the center as belonging to everybody. I, age, wish, I, wish we could, I wish we could talk some more. <laughs> I particularly would love to take you up on the issue of intergeneration oh, yeah, gap and now we can either shrink the gap uh, and uh, direct that towards national development. But that yes. will be um, when next we have the opportunity okay, thank you to so have much. you on this platform. Director General National Senior C Citizen Center, Dr. M.M. Omokaro, I want to thank you so much for coming on Insights. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And please, you know, let the news go on that we are set to turn around, you know, situations of older persons. Thank you. Up next, Elizabeth Omori with the Media Review segment. Nigeria is currently confronted with myriads of challenges with heavy toll on critical sectors. One of the most piercing problems is that of insecurity. Government efforts towards this challenge is gradually recording success, but tackling it seems like a herculean task. With the spate of banditry, kidnapping and other crimes, how do we achieve sustained national unity, peaceful coexistence and security in Nigeria? My guest, Barrister Lawrence Eko Alovi, former Commissioner of Police, FCT, will suggest effective and adoptable ways to address an insecurity in Nigeria. Sir, it's nice to have you join us on Insight. Thank you for having me. You know, we can't actually talk about security without talking to you. We are confronted with several forms of crime. Where did we get it all wrong? Yeah, thank you very much. Many factors contribute to what, where we find ourselves now. Section 14B of the Constitution amplifies the importance of security for the welfare of the people, of the people which provides that uh, the welfare and security of the people is the primary purpose of government. But now, like you really ask, what, why, where, where do we go wrong? We went wrong many ways. First and foremost, the principal agency that meant to that, that is under the law, certainly provided to maintain law and order, provide internal security, Nigerian police force for. Too long a time has been neglected. Nations are built on law and order. Mm -hmm. A nation the way the law, law and order cannot be granted is almost a failed nation. And if the police, which is a primary agency, like you see, when we have a tree, the top of the tree is, is, is the main firm that holds the trade firm. And if the tree, other supportive roots, like, you know, who are just the support, but the main, the main root, top root, the one that gives the force that requires to, for the tree to, to, to stand without without being, being uprooted by any, any storm or any wind. So this is what went wrong. And again, Section 24E of, e of the Constitution provides that every Nigerian citizen has a duty to, to assist law and civil agency maintain law and order. Therefore, if you just oppose Section 14B and Section 24E, it shows that security is a responsibility of all of us, the government, security institutions, and the citizens. But I mean Nigerians are prepared to assist security agencies maintain law and order. For instance, recently there was above after the after the answers, there was this attack on police stations, oh. attack on and the uh, INEC officers and so forth. The citizens are, they have a duty. Unfortunately, in this country, we emphasize on our rights and obligations, with our, our rights and our rights and our rights, our, our freedom. We don't think about our obligation as citizens. Every Nigerian citizen under 24 years has obligation 
to assist the Secretary General in the law, law and order to ensure that we contribute. It's our nation. Nation building is collective responsibility of all of us. If the nation collapses, we, we suffer. And the citizens are the prime beneficiary of a secure and safe environment. So the citizens have a duty to assist the police, assist the other soldiers like the military, the civil defense, the DSS, and immigration and customs to ensure that our, our society, our country is safe and secure and also give information and support. This will be, you have to empower, empower somebody. But you cannot ask a child to go to, to fresh water with bare hand. You must give them a of bowl. Course, of so, course. therefore, if I be an issue, the police is supposed to maintain law and order, grant it to security. All right. I'd like to come in there. You talked about law and order. Now, in enforcing law and order, are security agencies doing enough? Yeah, you see, they, 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 are, they are doing their best. Nigeria is about, we're told about 200 million or more, and the population is about that number. Look at, look at, look at the spread of the country, the of the country, and then look at the strength, for instance, the police, they're less and less, and we have less than 450,000 450, policemen, policing about over two, 2 million people. Policing and law and security today is technically driven, and knowledge-based, and knowledge-based, you acquire knowledge through training and capacity building. And knowledge-based, technically driven is that, how, how, how has technology been employed in this, country, in this country? For instance, like, how many, we don't have drones in this, in our FCD. For, every state should have at least no less than six drones to monitor and kind of aerial patrol. And they, then the men on the ground be well equipped. And not only providing vehicles, sometimes some governors don't need vehicles to the police. Not only don't need vehicles. How do you, how they being maintained? How they being fueled? What if the men go, go for this patrol? Are they being given some little allowances to, to motivate them? Because when a man leaves his house at about 7.30, 8 of the, he'll be left to this. No policeman works than 12 hours in a day. And mm -hmm. they don't pay any, anything extra apart from the Amiga salary. So I think this has to be looked at it holistically. The government has to be, have to develop the capacity, the, the willpower to show we, we need to equip our police and fund our police, fund our school agencies, and ensure that the citizens also have to rise up and say, we must make our country safe and secure for our own benefit. And I want to strongly recommend the, the NTA and the Minister of Information that let's introduce a program on that, that is unity, peace, and security education. Because character is everything. If we, if, if we need to develop that consciousness, that kind of attitude, it's our country. We need to contribute, not just being parasitic. How can I add value? How can I contribute? How can I, how can I make my country safe and secure? But unity is key. So I think we need to ensure this invent the spirit of unity amongst us. Listen, Nigerians, not every Nigerian, every Nigerian citizen should be the same as a Nigerian. The world God gave us the world. We didn't, we didn't create this world ourselves. How much I pray to God? So if we're in a country, we should see how we could be united. Our founding father has a vision of yes. a united country that will be viable, strong, to be a true gen of Africa, not just by words of mouth. So we should all be united. The government should have the, 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 the political will to fund good agencies, empower them. Our citizens also rise to the occasion and say that we must contribute towards the betterment of our country. We need to be united. We need to see about the security of our country. We need, to, we need to be peaceful. I think it will go a long way in transforming the situation. It will go a long way. All right, now, uh, when we talk about social breakdown in values, crimes are committed in societies world globally. It is a global phenomenon. Yes, it is. How do we help the society? How do we help the youths not to engage in crime? The children learn from what they see, what they call vicarious learning, from what they see and observe, they learn. Oh. And by the imbibe, that's what we call nature, not nature, nurture. You sometimes you are born with some innate characteristics or features in your life, in you. But also you, the way you are being, the environment in which you are being nurtured can also contribute towards either having a, a positive attitude or negative attitude. You see, the family itself is very, very key and important. But today, most families they don't they don't care about moral education, spiritual education of their children. They don't think about virtues, moral. Some of them even pray together. They don't even know that life has a purpose. Mm. And what are those things that will make you to see, to, 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 to find, make yourself worthy, worthy of the trust of others? The family has to, we have to reinvent our moral values, mm. spiritual values. The, the, the religious institutions, the church, the mosques, and so forth, should also de emphasize on materialism, breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. They de emphasize on virtues. The virtues, they say, when God created man his image and like that, said in the, the scripture, is that. The image of God in us is those attributes of love, of mercy, of compassion, of empathy, of sincerity, of truthfulness, of forgiveness. How, we, if we manifest this attribute, we show this pack of, we show, we now show the God in all. And we're answering social good to others. We show we're children of God, 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 children of God's grace to others. So when we imbibe all these moral values, we invent our, our churches or our religious organizations that are said in the program I'm suggesting, all these moral values will be, will be integrated. 
You need to teach us a good education. All the all, you say law, law is based on moral, 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 moral ethical values. Mm -hmm. Whether it's integrated and brought to the to the fore, and even from that, from even in our school, they should be taught in our schools. Let the children that have the fear of God, the fear of shame. The fear of God is that God is an all-seeing God, all-knowing God, and God, it's God is a God of justice. You see, why did God bless Abraham? Because Abraham obeyed. I want to put point at him because he disobeyed. So, if you want the, the, Lord, the Lord to protect you, you have to obey the law. These are things we need to inculcate our youth. The youth are just so a program being, being uh, organized this morning for you. That is commendable. You should be created to have that consciousness that they, they are there to contribute. And if they don't contribute, they have a very bleak future. So the youth have a role to play. Youth can change the, 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 the can change the nation. But getting leaders, leadership is not followership. Leadership is all about service. How to empower the people? Government should try to rekindle that confidence. They, 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 say, they believe in their government. They say know that they have a role to comp to, 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 to to contribute. They say know that government is all the leaders are all there for them. Not only that, not just for themselves and for their cronies. Lawrence Eko Alobi, former Commissioner of Police, FCT. Sir, we want to thank you so much for coming on Insight. Thank, thank you, you for your contributions. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's it on this episode of the program. Do join us same time next week for more on Insights. My name is Nam Deodipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. Be security conscious always. We'll see you next week.